So it's being videotaped, I guess everybody knows that. Um, and also, I'm curious how many people are going to be away next week studying with her to, I know one person who is. Is people here away? Here, here, here. So, question. Okay, so I, I think we'll just continue on this Monday, Tuesday schedule. Um, so let me quickly review what we did last time. Finish it up. All right. This is traditional. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to review the structure quickly. Um, and get to the one of the punchlines, which I didn't quite get to last time, which is um, that kind of role implying a state module. And then I think I want to just talk about axiom in you know, different ways people have tried to axiomatize TQFTs. And then finally, um, give our own axiom. So finally, start making these a little more precise and rigorous after this lengthy introduction I've given. Um, okay, so last time we talked about field functor manifolds. Less than n plus one, and with something fixed, um, and then we had a function t from fields on n plus one manifolds, complex numbers. T is equal to e to the is in the usual physics notation. And we have the path integral um, z. Plus one manifold with boundary condition C. Um, and that was the integral of one close to the number of that precise. Um, over fields on W boundary condition C. Um, we defined a vector space for n manifolds, which is a set of all functions from the fields to um, m to complex numbers. So this isn't really yet the, the Hilbert space. You know, this will be a big infinite dimensional space, but eventually we're interested in a typically finite dimensional subspace of this. Um, but we can think of the path integral of a n plus one manifold as being some vector. You know, so if we think of the C as an argument, then it's a function on boundary conditions. And so this lies in this big vector space there. Um, also, if we we might assume there's some kind of inner product on V again deriving from this path integral, say over n plus i. And so, if we like, we can take W and divide it into an incoming boundary, an outgoing boundary, boundary of boundary n, P. Some boundary condition D, which is the field of the key. So it the key is there and there, this example. Um, and then we can think of the path integral of W as being a function from vector space associated to the boundary to the outcome boundary. Um, oh, and it's going to depend on the, so we have a collection of such things for all. D runs through all values and these vector spaces have that information. 
So I should define this. I should put a boundary condition here. Um, and so in particular, we can do this. We can take W to be a product manifold. Um, and create a projection. Z of n plus i. Um, so D going from D of n. So why is this? So I and mean, I should remind you that when I write manifold cross i and the manifold has a boundary, um, but I'm, I'm really thinking of pinched boundary conditions. So. So this would be a literal picture of an interval across uh, um, because I want the full boundary of my products to be you know, two, two copies of them. I don't want this sort of boundary on cross I. So push that out. So let's call this uh, the projection associated to MV. And then we define the Hilbert space, which is so the Z of and it's defined to be the image of the projection. Um, how do we know this is a projection? Well, that's because if you take two copies of M cross I as this, same thing as M cross I. So that shows that it's an um, we also know that Z of W, the N plus 1 manifold, is contained, you know, we saw this contained in the speak space, but it's actually contained in the subspace. And that's because um, we take W and we want to call it, let's just again put W. Um, and then we also we considered um, in manifold M, symbol D, some boundary condition D. In this circumstances, so for all such B contained in M, um, we had a projection of pi sub B from vector space associated to M. So the vector space. Um, and this was this pi sub B was a sort of direct sum of as we let D run over all possible bound conditions. Um, and then we noted that if we take M cross I and we glue on B cross I, that's again equal to M cross I. So it follows that the um, image of I sub M is contained inside the image of I sub M. And then, since this is true for all B, we have that. Z of M. The condition of the notation for now is contained in the intersection over all B contained with M. Of um, Something stronger is true because we can um, and notice the pattern. You know, so what we've done over and over again here is we have some. You know, we have, have this procedure for turning, you know, going from manifolds into algebra, some kind of functor in some informal sense. We'll try to make that precise later, and then whenever we have some sort of equation that's true for manifolds, like this product 
move to itself in this way, it just gives you the same thing. It gives us an algebraic equation. This projection composed of itself is a different projection. And these two things move together with this, and so on. Um, so the, and then one final one is that we can take, if we have um, E sub i, which is a cover of M, um, then you can write M cross i is equal to the union of E sub i cross i. So the one-dimensional picture of that is, so again, you sort of try to you know, get from the bottom to the top and you sort of you one cross i, two cross i, and just sort of keep adding these lumps of clay or something and build up the whole thing. So this implies that in fact z sub m is equal to the intersection This is the, kind of the punchline of the last lecture. Okay. So, any questions at this point? So, um, the n cross i equals the union of the i cross i. Uh, I don't understand your proof. Oh, um. Think of it like a partition of unity. I guess one way of thinking of it is um, given a cover, we can take a compatible partition of unity. And so then I can draw a picture where the, you know, this height, this distance from here to here, is a partition of unity for that particular thing. And then I just choose some ordering of these, it can be any order. And, and so the, you know, if I was to draw sort of a literal metric picture of the height you know, these, all these numbers, this plus this plus this has one. So, yeah, but I, I, I mean, when you, you know, for load, you know, by training, I'm a load dimensional topologist, so we just so these things obvious and we get to indicate the proof. So. Um, but maybe, should, you know, this is maybe in the past, and I'm trying to explain this to people. Seem to get confused. Yeah. So, for example, if, if, uh, if I have a point which is only contained in one of the open um, sets, then the thing goes all the way to yep. the top. Yep. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so now let's consider the dual of that picture. Um, so, for this big vector space, all functions, this space is finite C linear combinations of fields. Okay. Now we want to say that the, the subspace. Can we call it the pre dual, not the dual? It's the pre dual, not the dual? Oh, maybe. Let's see. Okay. Yes. Just to be really pedantic with language. No, no, no it's not. It's not it's not <laughs> no, yeah, good point. Um, but, but I think, as I emphasized last time, you know, this is what I've been writing here. Isn't meant to be rigorous mathematics because the well, the thing I just erased the path integral. I never really said precisely what that was, and no one knows how. And, and except in maybe some very simple examples to say precisely what that is. So now we're sort of making the kind of arguments we might make in a physics paper, but not in a math paper, but soon, in five minutes, we'll switch and start trying to do this. Um, okay, so let's define, so we want to want to describe in a description of dual, or maybe for dual, and the offense is finite dimensional, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, of the dual that's sort of compatible with this, this thing here. So let me define um, a s u, given say a ball and the boundary condition. To be um, C 
set of all x of all finite linear combinations. Um, such that f of x is equal to zero for all f. So these are the, the fields which are invisible to all these the functions that live in zero. And it's easy to see that the dual space for a ball. This is all kind of tautological, but now using the, the fact that this Z is the sort of image of a bunch of commuting projections, um, we will define for a general manifold of the boundary condition um, a subspace. And this is. Um, it's generated by a set of all u dot r. So what does that mean? Well, the dot means these things together. Um, this. So I have m the ball d, the u, which is one of these null fields on the ball. Um, And R is a field on the problem. Right, so I want to consider the subspace generated by all such things, so I don't know. Ball and the boundary condition run over all possibilities, and so that's some space. And what we finally see is that um, then, sorry if it's finite dimensional, it is naturally isomorphic to what a few lectures ago we were calling A, then you can see that that's just defined to be. Two of the punchline um, of that long derivation we did last lecture is that you expect any TPFT, anything that's defined the way a physicist would define TPFT in terms of fields and actions and path integrals, you expect the, the Hilbert space to be dual to this thing here, which is basically our scheme on the construction that we're working on before. So this we started out, and I spent a whole lecture giving examples of scheme, scheme module local relations. Um, and in fact, that sort of thing, that's sort of a, a universal way of describing these pre dual spaces. Um, okay, so, so what's the plan for the rest of the course? Um, we, yeah, I'm sorry, I erased the path integral, but the, you know, the path integral that integration over fields, that's notoriously difficult to make. Precise, in the very simplest examples. So it needs to find some other way of getting to the conclusions. And what we're going to take as a starting point is this. We're going to you know, axiomatize what we need out of these fields and what we need out of these local relations with structure vector spaces like this, and then try to build all the rest of the theory from that point. Um, so Why do we want to do it that way? Well, you know, one reason is we can't do it the, the proper way, the physicist way. But another advantage is that sometimes um, 
it's more it's more general if we don't worry about the path number of existing. We'll find examples where these actually are infinite dimensional vector spaces, and so we couldn't possibly have a path interval that has all the properties we would like it to have. Um, but these are still interesting examples. And in some applications, for example, quantum computing, um, you really care about the, the vector spaces, you don't care about the So I burden ourselves with having more practices. So can I ask why you didn't just, it seemed that, that we, we were perfectly happy to, like we, I could have just said z of m is, so maybe I'm confused with what's the definition and what's a, a, a theorem. I could have tried to define z of m, sort of the, the z dual, as just being the quotient mod of v of m dual modulo of the things that were invisible. Um, and instead, it seemed that we were defining it sort of. I might, should, I, should I sort of say that that's the definition, but then it's a statement that it's equal to this, this quotient out by little balls? Um, or should I just take this whole thing as motivation and move on? You're wondering why I didn't make a definition like similar to this one? Yeah, sort of why can't I just like systematically replace every B by an M in that, that definition? Yeah, that would be true, but that would, um, that would under describe it because it's not, because we're going to. We want to do things locally, so we don't want to say for every manifold in we have the subspace and they have to satisfy some properties. We'd rather just say for balls we have the subspace and everything follows from that. Okay, so the statement is the sort of, if I did have a path integral, then probably the the answer just with the definition that I would get by replacing the by m is the same as this. Yeah. And so since I don't have a path integral, I'll take this as the right theory. Yeah, some, some, something like that. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure exactly. You know, I can think of a few reasons why. Interpretations of your question, um, but one, you know, we, we prefer. Okay, so you, you were just asking why didn't I do this, but right hand instead. Yeah. Of why wasn't yeah. that your definition? Um, because because that should be equivalent to. It, it would be like you know if we. Talked about these other things, but did we fail to notice this? Right. Then you know, then we, that would probably be our definition. But when you notice this, and this is very useful because it expresses the locale. You know, if you, if you just have to make that your definition, and then say, okay, when we chop an m-manifold in half, how do we assemble the Hilbert space out of the two pieces? And we, there's no immediate answer. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you express it in this form, or in this form, then we do have an answer. Okay. So. Yeah, so I think what you're proposing would be true, but we can make kind of a, this is like a sharper. Yeah, so sorry, I have a stupid question. Um, you're saying if we express it, just to recap what you're saying, if we express it this way, yeah. then um, the wing is somehow easy to express? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, that's not maybe obvious. I mean, that will you know, spend you know, a future lecture talking about. But, it, but again, you know, things gluing nicely has to do, you know, the, our mantra's locality. You know, seems really nice. Yeah, I guess one thing I should have said here, maybe this will satisfy you too, is that um, it follows from what I wrote over there that if we def let's define u prime of n to be you know, the set of all x such that I think that's here as well, and z of them. That's the definition you want to make. Yeah. And it, it follows from what we read over there that that u prime of m is actually equal to u of m, or u of m is the thing I defined as slope. Okay. So that I made the definition. So that. Okay. So now um, let's talk about definitions and the various ways we might try to define a TQFT. So some of this is going to be more. Philosophical or editorializing or something, but it also will help situate the way we're treating TQFTs here with respect to you know, other things. You want to see. Okay, so the Defining TQFT would be we have you know, some fields F and we have action 
S and then function T is equal to T I S and then we we'll just go from there. Half and roll and so on. <coughs> so that's you know, that's sort of our default you know, or definition of the TK of T. But the, the problem with that is that it's, it's hard to make this rigorous. So one looks for ways around it, and the first way around it was a T as definition. And this is he was following some similar definition of C going and conforming to the theory. Um, and so what if Tia said, well, well, let's just forget about all the way we divide things. You know, one of the consequences of what the physicists do is, is a functor on a cobordism category. So for, you know, so for, say, closed and manifold, Some vector space Z. And for a uh, cobordism W between N1 and N2, we can map Z and W from N1 and N2. And this is functorial cobordism, in other words, these components. Um, and that that was a very influential definition, um, but it actually I, I think has a lot of problems. Um, it's not that it's false, I and mean, you do get these things, and it's, but it, it really under describes the situation. Um, so how how does it under describe things? Well, one one thing it says nothing. Of, Yeah, so, so first, maybe it doesn't give you a hint about how to construct TKFTs. You just have to, using other, perhaps totally different methods, somehow cook up the vector spaces and words and boxes. Uh, but there's nothing in this definition that, you know, that um, helps you do that. Um, but the other problem, the bigger problem, is that. Um, you know, something, you know, suppose we want to describe this vector space M in terms of cutting it into pieces, and you know, how would we do that, and so on. And even the, you know, some of the very earliest examples, for example, the regression tick and derive, you know, trim Simons variants, had this property that, you know, not only did we have vector spaces associated with surfaces, but we could just chop the surfaces up into pieces. And, and Witten's, you know, paper on the Jones bond, I mean, he emphasized quite a bit that, that the only way he was able to do computations was to notice you know, this property. And what we've been sort of emphasizing before is that that should always be the case. So I think that maybe the first person, I'm going to attribute this to Freed. Um, but I don't know if he was the first person to do it, but if he was the first person to do it, you know, to my knowledge, clearly. Um, these might be called. Um, Fully extended. See the axioms. So, I mean, what Fried said roughly is that if um, X is a K manifold, we want to associate to it um, and N minus K. Category and um, I guess if it's you know, for the closed case, and then again we should have some kind of you know, how do I want to say this? If we have a bordism, we should have some maybe some kind of functor or bimodule for n minus k categories and whatever that means, and those should compose. So there, we get these sort of multiple, multi-level structures all the way down to k equals zero, where we would assign an n category for n plus one dimensional TQFT. Um, and that, you know, I think this is probably the 
uniqueness or variations on it, uh, is sort of the dominant definition there. Um, so, so what's wrong with this? Um, it's, you know, to my mind, it seems a little complicated. One, we have to define what a you know, what a general, what an in mind in category is, and that's not so easy. I mean, you know, we all know sort of what it is, but if you want to define it precisely and talk about these functors or categorified by modules between things and to take intensive products over it, that's a lot of that's a lot of work. Um, and it seems that somehow the actual examples we're talking about are, are much simpler than you know, these pages and pages of definitions we see in categories. So it you know, sort of feels like there's got to be a better way. Um, or put, put another way, um, you know, we were coming up with these very concrete descriptions of these Hilbert spaces, and this seems to ignore that. So, you know, so one way to think of it is so I don't know, my, my silly picture. So we have bathroom. Because it was a scary monster. And it's standing in our way. You know, we're trying to get trying to get from here to here. And so there's one, you know, we could take a long road around, you know, sort of skip all the in between. This is the uh, TS single way, but we actually, you know, we actually it's fine to go all the way up to here and then just take a much shorter path. So, so, I apologize for <laughs> picture. But the, but the point is, is that doing, you know, I guess often, you know, in mathematics, you come across some interesting examples and say, well, let's axiomatize these. And so you write down some properties that your examples have. But how do you know that, it's easy to check that, you know, your examples do have their properties, but how do you know that you wrote down enough? I mean, you know, maybe they have a lot more properties that you're not mentioning, but that, and I think, you know, if one, if you look at the subject of like, you know, tensor categories and those sorts of things, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of definitions there where they, you know, they'll, they'll have, you know, spherical implies pivotal implies, you know, fusion, blah, blah, blah. But if you ask, okay, are there any known examples that are one of these things and not the other, the answer is no. So they're writing these, you know, they might as well assume the strong, stronger things. So, so I think similarly here, um, you know, Tia, you know, vastly underdescribed, you know, what TQFT is. He just, you know, it's just sort of the tip of the iceberg has the structure. And then in the subsequent years, it was realized that you need to do something more like this, which does a much better job of describing it. But I think we can go a little bit further than this and sort of work in particular at these fields and these local relations in the picture. And I think that just makes things easier. So our Fourth definition, that's the one I want to start giving now, is on fields and local relations. Um, and so what, what does that mean? We're gonna ask, we're gonna say, what do we need out of this functor f in order for things to work? And what do we need out of these subspaces u in order for things to work? And then everything else can be described in terms of those. So instead of having to define what a new category is and specify things for all the k-manifolds, you're just going to specify this and this. It's pretty simple, and then we'll derive all these things. So it's pretty easy to see that from this four-style definition, we can get a three-style definition. Uh, that's what we spend a lot of subsequent lectures doing. And I think if you have a definition of this style that's precise enough, I mean, there's, there's lots of things we could do here. Like we could stop when k gets down to one or two. Um, but if it goes all the way down to zero and things are just stubborn enough, I think you can actually go back the other way. Um, and so in some sense, it's equivalent, but it's just more convenient. In, in the same way that you know, when you're defining a um, combined Neumann algebra, you know, the, you can say, well, it's uh, you know, sub, some sub-algebra of the bounded operators on Hilbert space, and that's pretty convenient. Or you can try to give the abstract definition of the bounded algebra, and that's 
you can show it's equivalent, it's not so easy and it's not convenient to work with. And I think similarly, so you know, in some sense, this definition for this is like defining the you know, von Neumann algebra to, in a concrete way. This is some subspace of D of H. And three is maybe a more an abstract definition, which you know, if we write down enough things in three, we'll be able to actually reconstruct. Okay, um, so what are these axioms? How much time? And by the way, I don't think, I think in the advertised abstract of this talk, I said I was going to get to like the path integral theorem and classifying non plus one dimensional theories. I don't think we're going to get that far. So. Um, So I think in, in order not to get too bogged down, I'm going to give you know, a, a somewhat detailed definition of what we would call a field functor, but I'm going, to, I'm going to leave out some of the even more technical details and I'll try to come back and do this later. Because of the examples we've mentioned so far, you know, these simpler axioms that I've talked about are good enough, but there'll be other things that we need to tweak them a little bit. So, fields. So we can think of them first. Let's think about you know we have manifolds, and what structure do manifolds of dimension um, S and equal to n have? Well, we can take the boundary, and we can do things together, and we have you know, collar neighborhoods. These, you know, there's some structure that does that. So a field is roughly some kind of mapping of all of this interrelated structure into the algebra. Some kind of denoting algebra the sets. Um, so the first thing we want is um functors, call them S of K from Units of K is my category of K manifolds. And so homeomorphisms or diffeomorphisms morphisms if you're doing things smoothly, smoothly or maybe there's orientations. So we, you know, we pick some category of manifolds, like piecewise linear manifolds, pseudo manifolds, topological manifolds, manifolds as an orientation of the spin structure, or you know, things like framings. And the only mass between them we consider are sort of the isomorphisms in that category. So we want to functor from that into just the category of sets. And then we do this for k between 0 and n. Why not n plus 1? Because we're, we're never going to do a path integral. So we're at very top level with the theory is going to be treated a little bit differently. So we don't need the fields that are just really bad. Okay. Um, what else can you do with fields? Well, you can restrict the boundary. We're doing that over and over again in our sort of hand waving physics argument. So um, we should have maps boundary from fields on X to the K manifold to the K minus 1 dimensional fields on boundary of X. And this should be a natural transformation, you know, the collection of all such maps. Um, in other words, it commutes with the homeomorphisms. Um, now, one of the details that I'm going to skip today, but we'll have to talk about later. Is actually, you know, what do we mean? You know, when we take the boundary of an oriented manifold, how do we do that? Well, the, the normal answer is we say something about you know inward normal last or inward normal first, and we get an orientation on an n minus one manifold. But it turns out this appropriate for this subject is we want to think of all our lower dimensional manifolds as having a little bit of a, a germ of a thickening to n dimensions. And so the boundary of an or n dimensional oriented manifold is going to be an n minus one manifold with an orientation of its you know, product thing. Um, 
So I'll say, <clears throat> I'll say more about that later when we've got some examples where we actually need that kind of detail. Um, but for now, I'm going to suppress it. Which reminds me, <clears throat> what I meant to say before I started giving this definition is um, what examples do we have in mind? The ones <clears throat> that we talked about the first couple of lectures, but um, let me just remind you we can take f of x, one example. So these are examples. f of x could be the set of all maps from x into some target, target space. Say, started out in the very first lecture talking about. Um, and more generally, we have f of um, y being the set of all um, string diagrams. Um, y, what do I mean by string diagram? Well, we'll say more about it later, but it's sort of the dual to a pacing diagram for some kind of end cap. So we're assuming we have some other notion of an end category. <coughs> n equals 2, that's not so hard. And we have pictures labeled like this, which are from way to, you can just consider all possible you know, for n equals 2 beta n equals So as we go through these axioms, we want to make sure that everything we write down is true. For Okay. Um, okay, so three is um, gluing. And we're going to do it in three stages. First, we'll consider gluing along the empty set, it's just disjoint union. Then we'll consider gluing along closed manifolds. And then we'll consider gluing with groups. Oh, I should say another. Another way in which some of these early definitions are inadequate is you know, gluing with corners is important and useful. It wasn't until later that people started to build that into the structure. So I did he use gluing and cutting with corners? no, he didn't. But there's um if you look at my ninety one notes, which are you know, sort of an attempt to on the trend of this paper there, one of the corners figures. Yeah, I, I think I, I should, you know, while we're making these meta mathematical comments, um, you know, I, I was describing how physicists might define a TK of T. I you know, said, well, we've got fields, this and path integral, and maybe something like this, but one. One thing that physicists tend not to do is go down to this higher categorical stuff, and um, you know, which we should feel proud about as mathematicians. You know, over the last 20 or 30 years, it's been this, at least in geometry and topology, there's been all these great ideas coming from physics, and you know, mathematicians you know, struggle to come to terms with them. Um, but I think in the sort of higher category theory that figure you know, here, here, here you know, maybe physicists have something. A symptom of that is what we did in the forms. Okay, so 3A is just that we want fields on x1 and disjoint union, x2 to be naturally isomorphic to fields on x1 and cross fields on x2. So natural with respect to homeomorphisms and also also with respect to taking boundary. 
write all that down. Um, so 3B, in order to stay 3B, I already need 3A, that's my breaking point cases. Um, suppose I have a manifold of X. Suppose that something else I should say is that at the very beginning I wrote the subscript, but um, I tend to admit the subscripts, they should be clear from context. So whatever you know, affects this k-dimensional um, okay, so I it's clear. Okay, suppose we've got x, and the boundary of x is um, equal to, say, y. So y1 distort mean, y2 distort mean s. So that I have in mind something like this. Move those two things together. And so to do that, we need a map. So we also have some homeomorphism from y1 to y2. So now we can draw the following diagram for um, before we draw it, I some notation I forgot to introduce here. We've been using it, but now I want to officially define it. So if I write f of x so we can c, we c is a field on the boundary of x. Um, this is defined to be the boundary of x. This is just the fields which restrict a single boundary. So, fields on the x, which maps be the boundary map of fields on y1. Start this diagram. If you want to start with you, I'm just okay. going to sneak up. Yeah. It gives me a chance to type. You should keep erasing so that I can keep up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now I was apologizing for the sloppy diagram I was about to draw, but not for erasing. So I want to draw it again in a more coherent way. Um, so maybe I'll I'll start at the end. Right, so we're going to define two different maps for fields on Y1. So we want to have F acting. Projection onto the y2 factor, projection onto y1 factor, and then here, the fields on x, and this boundary map. Boundary map composes this identification down here. That's why we needed to talk about this sort of first. And so then this, the statement is that there's an inclusion for the fields on x due to itself according to f and that, that this is um is equalizing the two maps of so what I've said just in a very complicated way is you know, the fields on the up manifold somehow the fields on the cup manifold that agree on so I just tried to set it all on diagrams so that if you later want to Generalize some of the category. Um, uh, 
Ah, but, okay, so now we should check, is this true in our examples? Well, for maps of the spaces, yeah, that's clearly true. Um, we'll probably have to do things like the boundary, but if we consider these sort of temporal type things or string diagrams, we see that we miss some because we suppose um, let's take a, a close up of the ruling locus here. You know, we might have had some kind of submanifold that was not transverse to the boundary, and we would never see that by cutting the blue line. So what we really want to say is that um, Sitting inside here is the equalizer of the two maps uh, that also works the fields on. So we'll call the image um, the things that are transverse to down here. So you don't, so this is kind of an annoying technicality, um, but yeah, it's an annoying technicality, which doesn't come up in our first family examples of maps and spaces, but definitely comes up in these things where we have some kind of labeled graph or something like that. And there's sort of no way around it. I mean, it's very useful to consider examples like this, so we just have to deal with this fact that um, you know, instead of saying that the equalizer of you know, these two maps is everything, it's, it's just some subspace. And it, it's almost everything in the sense that you can make precise later, but um, okay. So now, finally, so the correct definition you're saying, I should. I, I see. So I think that the correct. So the correct definition. Again, I apologize for making your job <laughs> difficult by being here myself. From, from our previous axioms, we can draw a diagram like this. Mm -hmm. um, and we can then consider this thing equalizer. So that's, that's something that already exists according to what we've said so far. And then, so the axiom is that there's a map from this equalizer into here. And then furthermore, that map is natural with respect to everything else we talked about. Mm -hmm. Taking down the user that kind of thing. Um, So the, the final thing, blue and corners, I think maybe I won't go through. Yeah. We don't have infinite time in the lecture, so I'm going to not give quite as many details for the next one. But the idea is if we're in some situation where we want to blue along corners. So can I just ask, like, should I? In, in sort of the best of worlds, what I want to say that like f of x blue is some sort of like homotopy equalizer or something? Is that the way that you're going to? Because you sort of wanted to say that f of x blue is like, like yeah, the equalizer is not quite as big as f of x blue, but it's somehow almost all of it. Like in the examples, at least I can sort of perturb anything to be in the equalizer. Yeah, so I, I think this, the sense in which we'll, ultimately, when we get to the top dimension, It's a good question, and I'm not going to have a, a very good answer. But um, so far, we're talking about fields, but we also want to talk about local relations. Mm -hmm. One thing the local relation will do is say that, okay, up to isotopy, we can jiggle things around. Okay. And so that means that in our top dimension, it may not be true that every field is um, you know, obtained by gluing, like the ones that aren't transverse are not to obtain, but they're isotopic to something that is. So in the quotient, we get everything. You know, in the natural quotient, we get everything. And then when we take it one level down, it will be saying that you know, not every object in our category comes from gluing, but up to isomorphism, and so on. So in the sort of sense of category isomorphism, that's the sense in which we're doing this. Okay. Not in some measure of the biblical sense. Um, Again, I, I think, 
part of the reason I'm hesitating here is when we work with the actual examples, things will seem much simpler than these axioms. Um, okay, so 3C. Um, so we're in this situation now we have x is equal to not a disjoint union of three manifolds, but it's going to be y1 union, but not disjoint union. Here, one by two with the manifold of boundary, and then we've got the common boundary. Um, and so um, we have a subset. So, didn't come prepared to say this precisely. So, let me just give you the idea. And if you need to say it precisely later. But um, we want to consider um, somehow relate fields on the glued up manifold with fields here. So, one thing that's certainly going to be true is that um, on the glued up manifold, any field we get is going to have to be transverse to these sort of these corners. This could mention two things. And um, so that's a, well, it's just another thing. So maybe I should do this as an exercise. <laughs> you know, make this, make this precise. You know, say, say what it's reasonable to say. And the thing to do is to check that it's you know, true in these sorts of examples. So there's some other equalizing sort of argument. Huh. Um, so something else we need, um, I call this products, some colors. And that's a functor we'll call it product of I going from, pardon, Natural transformation part is going from K to F K plus one. And what is this supposed to be? Well, in the first example, if I've got a map um, from X into my target space, then I can consider the projection from X plus I. A map like that, so it's just this thing where we you know, pull that pi star. Um, with these fields, if I've got some kind of diagram or sub manifold on a, on a K manifold, I can just take all the things by the <clears throat> We'll need this because we want somehow we want to be able to assume that things are somehow standard for the boundary. Um, okay, so maybe I'll stop there. So let's. So in what ways has this fallen short of a? Official definition of all the details. So we'll you know, have to make some, you know, write out the details and just doing on this thing. Um, and anyway, I guess we also have to say well, what we mean by taking the boundary of the manifold in terms of like germs and structures and things like that. Which we'll come back to a little bit. Okay, this, these are fields. So. I apologize for being a little sloppy here. Um, 
the final thing we need to do in our list of axioms is say, well, we need to have local relations, and that's that's pretty simple. So. local relations, so it consists, um, so we assume we already have some fields, and then so for all C, which fields on the boundary of a ball, an n-dimensional ball, we only do this in the dimension, we want a subspace U of the C contained in these finite C combinations of fields. And what properties do these subspaces have to have? Um, so one is that they they form an ideal under gluing. So they have balls B1 and B2. We have U in to do trivial field in B1. Some value conditions, and I have some arbitrary field. B2. And these and they're bounded and they're such that we can move them together, then u dot r lies in the subspace would be one in the appropriate value conditions. Um, and secondly, If um, x and y lie in fields of the ball, and x is isotopic to y, i.e., we have some f going from the ball to itself. F is um, isotopic to the identity, and y is equal to f of x. Then the difference, x minus y, lies in this subspace. So if we think of these subspaces as defining some kind of local relations, um, all we're saying is that you know, if two things are related in B1, then any sort of consequence, you know, Jones students would say any annular consequence, is there, and that this local relation has to be at least as strong as isotopy. In fact, if you think about it, it should be um, at least as strong as pseudo isotopy in the sense of talking about pieces of mapping standards. So both of these um, things are clearly true for the use that we defined in our informal argument before, and so this is all we need. So that finishes, I guess, the sketch of our definition of a TQFT. So for us, our definition of TQFT is some fields which satisfy this. And there's, there's some examples to keep in mind that we might have some a little more obvious. And then it's some sort of local relations, i.e. subspaces of these finite combinations which satisfy these two properties. And it's pretty easy to cook up things with this. But what's hard is that if you just write down some random local relation, and then we look at these quotient scheme models of all these zero dimensional. So the skill is in um, finding things which don't collapse. But still, that's, I think, a lot easier than you know, filling in the details of some fully assembled TLC cell definition. So I think it's still a more parsimonious way to define it. Um, and we should think. I should have mentioned this earlier, but so a, phys a physicist would define a TQFT as fields sort of like this, together with this action that um, we can do the path under one. And so instead, what we're saying is you know, we want these local subspaces. But remember that these had to do with this projection associated to the ball, and the projection associated to the ball had to do with the path integral of an n plus one ball. So in some sense, we're saying that. Okay, if this is, you know, just tell me how to do the path integral for n plus one dimensional balls with all possible boundary conditions. I'll turn that information into these local relations and then we can do the rest combinatorially. So if we can 
do the path integral locally for just for balls. So we should think of this as these things as being some kind of slightly transformed version of the path integral. Um, okay, so it's kind of a logical place to stop, so maybe I should. But, so what we should do next is start basically systematic we want to reconstruct all the things that would be part of the T of SQL style axioms. We want to construct vector spaces for n manifolds and categories for n minus one manifolds and two categories for n minus two manifolds and so on. We will be able to do all that in a very concrete fashion. Um, the other thing we we'll want to do is maybe reconstruct the invariant for n plus one manifolds, and that's not quite as easy. You have to um, do a little combinatorial argument. So. So I would expect the, to get 